Good morning, and welcome to this place, for as we gather today, we believe that the Lord is in this place. So, however you come with whatever burdens or whatever joys, whatever concerns, you come into His presence and His stillness. So, let's begin worship as we sing, be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Let's pray together, shall we? Come close, Lord, we pray this morning, for sometimes you feel far from us. Come close, we pray. Sometimes you feel far, Lord, for we know we have wandered from you and strayed and gone our own way and put our fingers in our ears. And sometimes you feel far off, Lord, for it seems to us, feels to us that you have removed yourself. And so we come and we ask that you would draw close. Draw close that we might be still, for the presence of the Lord is moving in this place. Lord, sometimes we are restless and we can't sit still. We're anxious and we have no peace. But we would ask, Lord, this morning that you would come and grant us your peace. Come close, Lord, close to us who need your forgiveness, close to us who need your healing, close to us who need your encouragement and your strengthening, for we draw to you in Jesus who promised that we could always come to you as we pray the words that he taught us. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. I want to think about one little four-letter word this morning, and that's it on the screen. Yep. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not very good at using this word. 
So I want us to practice this morning so that we can use it. Can we try one, two, three, and just say help? Right? One, two, three. Help. Louder. Louder. Definitely louder. There must be many things we're needing help for, is there? One, two, three. Help. help. Yes. That's what we want to think about today. So I'm going to show you a few things that can go wrong, and I want to think about what it means to ask for help and who you might ask. What if you got up this morning, and I hope nobody did, and there's water pouring through your ceiling? Has ever, anyone ever had that? Yeah, a few folk. And what do you say? Help. help. But who do you call? Not Ghostbusters, no. Um, who are you going to call? A plumber, yes. A plumber, a DIY man, or at least somebody who knows where the water thing is so you can turn it off. And if you don't know that, you probably should. Right, okay, so that's number one. We probably know we need to call for help for a plumber. What about number two? You wake up and you're not feeling good at all. Where do you go for help? Could be a hospital, yes. If, if it's serious, you might have to call 999 and get an ambulance. That's right, okay. A doctor, yes. Yes, you need to get someone who's got some medical training to help you. Uh, it might be a doctor, and you might see a doctor in four weeks later. Um, um, or it might be you can phone and, uh, and get help on the phone or wherever it is, but you need to get help. And it could be more serious because it could be that you've actually got someone who's had a fall. What do you do when someone's had a fall? What do you get? Help. Where are you going to go? Probably a hospital for that. Yes, it might well be you have to phone an ambulance or get a first aider. And if you're in church, there's always a few folk around who do know how to help. Um, we've been very fortunate for that. It always said if you're going to fall ill, do it in church because there's always help around. Lots and lots of places to go for help. What about another one? You wake up and there's no power in the house. The lights are off. The fridge is off. The kettle's not working. No power. What do you need? Help. help. Where are you going to get it? A, 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 an electrician? Yeah, it could be. Or it, it could be that the fuse box needs switched back on or, or something like that. And if you don't know what you're doing, there's maybe a friend or somebody that can help you. But it might well be that you need to get the electricity people out to sort it. What about another one? What are you going to do if there's flames in the house? Fire brigade. Yes. Might well be the fire brigade. Yes. Um, you need help. You need to get somebody to put that fire out. And you can't just simply say, well, I don't like to ask for help, can you? It's something that's really urgent and you need to get help right away. What about another one? Here's somebody who's got some work to do and they're stuck. Anyone ever had that? Maybe homework and you're stuck. Where are you going to go for help? Could be your parents, yes. Although, when I look at what my daughters are studying, if they came to me for help, I wouldn't have a clue. So, it could be parents, yes. Where else might you go for help if you can't manage the work you've got? Sorry? Google it! Yes! Yes! Or get the artificial intelligence to do it for you. Yeah. Lots of different ways. But you might go and find a Ask your teacher and say, I, I, I'm struggling, I can't do the work if you're at school, or it, it might be going to ask a colleague or, or someone that you're, you're studying with and say, I, actually, I need some help here. What's the wrong thing to do is to try to keep going. Samuel? Alexa. Could be, yes, yes. Alexa knows our times tables, if nothing else, but yeah. Lots of places you can go for help, but the most important thing is to say help. What about another one? Anyone ever had this? You turn your computer on, and it's the blue screen of death. It's not working, or the printer won't connect, or something else. Anyone ever have computer problems? Where do you go for help? Sorry? Turn it off. Yeah, good idea. Where might you go for help with a computer? Sorry? 
your grandson. Yes, yes. But you know, you know, yep. Ask Alexa what to do. Does Alexa fix computers? Where to go, right? Yeah, aha. Uh-huh. Right, go on to the manufacturer or Apple or whoever it is, Microsoft or whatever it is, and say, my computer's not working. Yeah, it might be a helpline. That's where you phone the helpline, and five days later, you're still on hold, isn't it? But yeah, lots of places you could go. You know, one of the things that often happens, though, is that there are people around who know more about computers than you do. And I'm, I'm definitely at that age now where I suddenly realize I've got children that understand these things better than I do. Um, Alex Saini asks his grandson, um, I, I think that's why people have grandchildren, isn't it? <laughs> that that we, we ask for help. We don't just keep going, we ask someone. And some folk here will have a lot more knowledge of computers and other folk really can do with help. Or we could go to something else. You go to your phone and it won't read the email or send the call. Every, anyone have that problem? Or it's deleting something or something, messages coming up. Yeah. Right. Yes. They do wonderful and weird things, phones, sometimes, and you don't have a clue. But you know the good thing about phones is, unlike computers, you can take them somewhere and say, can you fix that and get help? And by the way, can I, can I just simply say it's something we can maybe even do in churches because quite a lot of folk here know quite a lot about phones and other people are struggling. Come to church, bring your phone, find somebody that's 10 years younger than you and say, can you fix it? <laughs> it probably will work because some of you, even some of, you, some of you, the youngest folk here are actually really good on phones and some of our oldest folk who know lots about maths and other things don't know anything about phones. So we can help each other. Or what about somebody who's being badly treated at school or in the office or wherever they are? Where do they go for help? Sometimes it's a big question, isn't it? Or being able to say, I need help just now. If it's in a school, yes, report it, tell the head teacher. If it's in an office, it can be really difficult, but we need to ask someone for help. I was thinking about this a lot um, in churches, that actually help is really important. And if I said to you this, how many folk would want to help someone who needed help if they could? Hands up. And I think most of us would say yes. Now, let me ask a different question. How many of us would ask for help when we needed it? You know what? That's the harder one. And the, one of the reasons that people don't get helped in churches is not because people aren't willing to help. It's because we find it very hard to say, I need help. Help. I want to just think about a story for a little minute. Um, well, not a story, a, a, true, a true incident in the life of Jesus that's in the Bible. And it was blind men who were sitting beside the road, and they knew Jesus was coming past, and they said and called out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And it was just two people at the wit's end calling out to Jesus for help. And we're told in the Bible that the crowd that day said to those people, shut up, be quiet, you're an embarrassment. But they kept calling Lord, help us, help us, help us. And as they did that, Jesus came to them and said to them, what do you want me to do? Now, He knew that they were blind. He knew their problems, but He wanted them to tell Him what was on their heart. And as they did that, we want to see Jesus felt compassion for them and healed them. The heart of our faith is that, yes, we should be helping each other and asking each other for help, but we do that because we believe in a God in Jesus Christ who is compassionate. And that means that when we have problems and needs, the thing that we do in worship most often is we come to Him and we honestly tell Him. And I hope this morning 
that as we pray together and as we worship together, that you before God would be able to share the things that you are really struggling with just now and know His love for you. And also in church, maybe it is that you need to speak to someone to, at the end of the service, ask for prayer, speak to one of the elders, speak to a friend, come and speak to me, and just simply say, I need help. And it might just be that you need someone to pray with you this morning. We're going to sing just now a song we, we know well, but it's just reminding us. And as we sing this song, just think about Jesus' love for you, but also the needs that you have to bring before Him this morning. And this song has a wee twist, but we'll find out about that, I think, as we sing it, will we?
children go out, Audrey's just going to come and say a few words about our junior church. Audrey. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, you'll know that we've made a couple of wee changes in our previous Sunday school. We're now referring to it as junior church, or trying to refer to it as junior church. We all, I, I slip up. But... Um, we're trying to move away from children coming in and sitting down and filling out worksheets and just kind of being school-ish. So we are being a wee bit more active and more involved. Uh, we also have a couple of messy things to do. So if you're bringing your children, please don't bring them in their best clothes just in case. Um, we, we've had to ch change the sections of our children's ages uh, for where they go, their, their different groups. Our creche has started and that's working fabulously and I believe it's newborn till the children go to school, unfortunately. I know that's not a good break in the age ranges, but we need to have enough adults to support it, the group, so it has to be nothing to five and then primary one to primary six is in what's called our junior section. Again, the age ranges are quite wide. It means that the leaders have to tailor the lesson for the, the different groups. And then we have our fusion children from primary six-ish, seven-ish, up to S2. And then we have a young adults group, which is about S2, and, and, and onwards. Now, I'm saying about and it, everything because it's not, the, the sections aren't age, as soon as you get to this age, you move on. It's for ability for the children. And if some of them want to stay in the, the younger group and have the, the fun there, that's perfectly fine. If they want to move up and have the fun there, that's great. And if they move up and they don't feel it, they can still come back. So we're trying to make our junior churches inclusive for everybody and make it work for everybody. The, the other thing which ties in quite well with Alistair's talk of help, <laughs> I'm really terrible for us about asking for help, but we really do need a couple of adults. It can be male or female, doesn't matter. It can be even our older youth who are not taking part in any of the, the groups that we have, but we need a couple of adults to just help the, the team work that wee bit smoother. As it is, we've got a couple of uh, leaders and they're going to be on every second week. So they're not really getting a chance to come into church and have their own worship time. And if, if you could give one Sunday a month or one Sunday every six weeks, that would be fabulous. Um, so if you could have a wee think about that and speak to me. I'm, I'm here on Sundays or I'll be in the coffee bar after church. And, and kind of that's us. I hope also... We are welcome to have any feedback from yourself or your children about how they feel of, with their new junior church. So please do come and tell us if we're doing it right, if we're doing it wrong, or if we can improve. Because at the end of the day, if we need to make sure our children are happy in our church to, to keep it going and move forward. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Audrey and to the team, and may God bless you and us as we support you in all, all that you're doing. But I'm going to let you go through just now to continue your fun and learning together. I've only got two um, brief announcements to add today. Um, one is to say that the quiz night, which you've seen on the sheets, um, which curry and quiz, or, or pasta if you don't like curry, on the 12th, on Tuesday the 12th, I think there's 50 folk already booked up for it, but there are still uh, availability if you haven't booked up. Who should folk see about tickets? Leanne, uh, one or two other folk be floating around. So if you, if you would like to come along, 
please do speak to, to Leanne and, and book up and you'll be more than welcome. The other announcement, which is on the sheet, but just to draw your attention to it, one of the things that we want to do as we look for help in our spiritual lives is to be able to come and read the Bible together and support each other. What we're, we're, we're planning to do on Thursday nights, um, starting a week on Thursday, is to have an opportunity to do just that for four sessions. The details are all on the sheet. We're actually going to offer it on Thursday afternoons and evenings because for some folk, evenings are better. For some folk, afternoons are better. But it will be the same session in the afternoon as the evening. So don't come to both unless, well, you can if you want, if you're really keen. We're going to be looking at the story of Elijah, which we actually looked at a, a, a few months ago in church. But Elijah's a great character because Elijah is somebody who does amazing things with God, but also someone who really struggles, um, someone who has uh, all sorts of, of, of difficulties in his spiritual life. So we're going to have an opportunity to, to look at that together. We'll watch a, a short DVD together uh, and then discuss things. It may well be that that's something you immediately say, I'd like to be part of that. Please make the effort. Can I just say, if Bible studies and things are something you've not been involved in, come and try and see what God might do. We will not embarrass you. We will not put you in the spot. You will not have to speak out in a group if you'd rather not. Um, but please, if you can, come and join us. And we'll look for more opportunities to do things like this in the future. That's all I have to announce. to read from God's Word. Um, we're continuing in the book of 1 Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians, um, reading from the beginning of chapter 3. Let us hear the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. 
the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace given to me, I laid a foundation uh, as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown up for what it is, because the day will bring it to light and it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Amen. And thanks be to God for His Word. Let's sing together, Christ is made the sure foundation.
Let's pray. Father, as we come to, to study Your Word this morning, to reflect on it, we ask that Your blessing would be here, Your Spirit would touch our hearts, that this might help us to grow and mature in Jesus. Amen. Well, we're on our third week of looking at the first letter to the Corinthians. Um, if you missed the first two, you'll find them on YouTube. Um, but just to recap a little bit of the background here, we said that, that Corinth was a, a Roman city, a, a fairly prosperous city. It was a port city, a trading place, a place where people had some rights, they were Roman citizens, but a massive differences between rich and poor. And Paul arrived in that place, and for 18 months, he was there. He taught, uh, he, he, he began to build a little church there with some friends, uh, and he would have left just with a little house church, a few couple of dozen people maybe that had come to believe in the Lord Jesus. And Paul then left and went to plant churches elsewhere. And sometime after that, a guy called Apollos arrived. And he stayed in Corinth for a while, and he became the pre a preacher in Corinth. And now, whatever Apollos was, he seems to have been a much better preacher than Paul. Paul will say elsewhere that he, he has a, he's not great at public speaking which may surprise us because we'd read his letters, but he may have had a stammer. Uh, he wasn't the greatest polished preacher. And, 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 and Apollos, well, he, he was erudite. He was well-educated. He really could, could draw a cloud, crowd, maybe even had better jokes than Paul. I don't know. But he was the guy that folk were really admiring. And what was happening there is that people were making comparisons between the old minister and the new minister and which one they liked best. You know, he wasn't so good at that, and he's better at that, and all the rest of it. And some of them were saying, I'm, I'm a follower of Paul, I'm a real Paul man. And some of them were saying, oh, Paulus is a real guy, Paul's got it wrong on this and that and the next thing. And there was one or two of them said, well, you know, actually, I've read my Bible. And Peter, he was the first apostle, he's the real deal. We should, be, we should be getting Peter over here and listening to him and reading his books. You know, so there's that sort of division going on. Now, here's the interesting thing. As you read the letter to the Corinthians, you'll discover that Paul wants to come to the Corinthians with all sorts of issues where he doesn't, uh, when he wants to change their thinking. And we'll have some fun with this later on because there are issues that matter to us today. He's going to talk to them about sex. He's going to talk to them about money. He's going to talk to them about how you live in this, this broken world. He's going to talk about spiritual gifts. He's going to talk about what we believe happens when you die, all sorts of big issues. But as he's talking about Apollos, it's interesting. At no point in this letter does Paul criticize Apollos. Now, if you know a little bit about Paul from his other letters, Paul had no problem denouncing false teachers. In fact, even Peter, Paul says at one point in Galatians, I told Peter he was wrong. But at no point in this letter does he criticize Apollos. Now, why does that matter? I, because of this. It seems to me that the obvious conclusion is that Paul 100% believes that what Apollos was teaching was completely consistent with what he was preaching. So, these divisions about I follow Paul and I follow Apollos weren't that people had some big theological important issue that they disagreed on as sometimes the church does. It was completely about style. It was completely about which clique you were in. It was completely about small and trivial things. Because you see, that's what people do. You know, sometimes in the church, we do have huge disagreements about issues that matter, and we have to work those through, and we have to express our opinions. That's completely true, but sometimes churches just have disagreements because people are like that. They fall out. They form cliques. They are in different groups. They have a chip on their shoulder about something, and that's the sort of thing that you will see here. You know, I have to say, and you'll know it yourself if you've been around churches any time, I have had people fall out. I have had people even threaten to leave churches over some really important issues. And I've had other folk fall out because the flower arrangement was in the wrong place. Or the Bible, whether it should be up there or on a lectern. 
and folk getting really uptight about it. Because you see, that's human nature. We like to get our own way. And once I've said my piece and people aren't listening to me, I'm going to say it again and again and again because you should be listening and you're not showing me enough respect. And my feelings have been hurt and I need to be respected. And this is what's going on. Paul calls it worldly. What does he mean by that? He means the church is behaving like lots of other human institutions do. That's what you find in your workplace. That's what you find in your school. That's what you find in your neighborhood. That's what you find in your street. And if you don't know examples of that, then I guess you live as a recluse. It's worldly behavior. It's human nature. We're all concerned about getting our own way. What's Paul's criticism of it? The church is supposed to be different. Now, this is at the heart of the whole of the letter of 1 Corinthians. It's Paul saying to a people, we are followers of Jesus Christ. We have this crazy view that a guy who was a criminal, rejected by the world, crucified and spat upon is the master of the universe. And this is weird. This is madness. This is the folly of the cross. But this mad view is going to shape the way that we live so that actually the church is supposed to appear to the world weird. You know, sometimes we have this big fear that people will come into church and they'll think we're weird. They should think we're weird because they should find that we are completely different, because we are living with this gospel that is insanely different from everything that the world, with all its strength and all its ideas of respect, teaches. The cross turned the world upside down, and the church should reflect that in living upside down. Think about it this way. Christ had the highest status possible. An innocent man who deserved the best God incarnate who deserved worship, and yet He chose to be humiliated. He chose to have His whole life rejected. He chose not to strut His stuff, but to humble Himself to death on a cross. And that's our model who believe in it for living, for interacting with each other, to be like Jesus. In the previous chapter, Paul ended by saying, we have the mind of Christ. By that, he didn't mean that we understand everything Jesus understood. That would be insane. He, he, he meant by this, we have the mindset of Jesus. Jesus who chose the way of the cross. You see, my security, and this is the thing that changes everything, does not rest on how much you respect me. It does not rest on what qualifications I've got. It does not rest on my sense of everything I've achieved in my life that I can look back on and somebody someday as they give a eulogy of Alistair May will give you all these wonderful things I've done in my life. That is not where my security rests. My security rests in knowing that the Lord of the universe gave His life for me. That He stooped and He washed my feet. And if I really believe that, if I really have that mindset, I have no need to strut my stuff and worry that somebody has hurt my feelings. And can you see how if we actually lived like that in church, it would totally transform the way that we interacted? Because that's what Paul is about here. What does that do if that's your mindset to your petty squabbles? What does that do when your nose is out of joint? What does that do when you have a sense of people shouldn't treat me like that? What does that do when I feel disrespected or undermined, when I know that the Lord of the universe gave His life for me? Suddenly, where the flower arrangement goes has become quite irrelevant. Or that my church building is under threat or that we didn't sing my favorite song last week. All of these things which cause division and quarrels, musical styles, suddenly become so irrelevant. And Paul starts this passage by looking at 
uh, uh, Paul and Apollos, himself and Apollos. Uh, and he's picking them because in one sense, because of this fight about who's who, they've become the high status people, haven't they? We're defining who we are by Paul and Apollos. And he says, who are these guys, Paul and Apollos? He says, they're servants. Servants. That's where we get the word minister from, by the way. Servants. Ministers of the crown. I, I love it when I have to fill in the insurance policy and I, I put in, a, I'm a minister, and it comes up, what type of minister? Is it a minister of religion? And I think, well, what other type of minister? Is it a minister of the crown is the other way? But the idea is that both words mean servants of a master. Now, here's the thing, what he's seeing here is that these people that you think are important are just the servants. Think of it this way, you, you go into a, a house, a really posh house, and uh, a man who is very well dressed greets you in perfect tones, and he invites you in, and he takes your coat, and you think, this must be the host, this must be the owner of the house. No, this is the butler. This is the butler. Paul and Apollos, yeah, they have important jobs, but actually they're not the important ones. The important one is the one who gave them this job. And again, the focus of our Christian community around the Lord Jesus, not around the minister or the elders or the way we run things or the constitution or the denomination, but around the Lord Jesus, right at the center of things. And Paul uses three illustrations, which I want to look at briefly. He uses field, he uses building, and he uses temple. Field, building, temple. We'll look at each one very briefly. First of all, he says, I planted and Apollos watered. Now, at a, at a human level, we might take this as a sort of, this is team ministry, isn't it? Each one has their own gifts and their own place to put on it. Paul planted the seed, he planted the church. Apollos came along uh, uh, and, and he watered it but that's not the point. The point isn't Apollos and Paul are a great team. The point is this. I only planted the seed, and He only watered it. It was God, God that was making it grow. God. And that needs to be the focus of everything that we do in church. What is God doing? How is God helping us, making us grow as a church, as individuals, in light of the Lord Jesus. The focus is not on who does what, or what's the greatest, or, or who's playing what, or what music it is, or how we structure the chairs, or any of these things. Our focus is always on God. God is at work shaping us into the image of His Son. And everything we do in church Every conversation, every meeting, every penny spent, every risk assessment done, every coffee drunk, every time given up, every role taken on is done for that reason, that the Lord is shaping us as we come together into the image of His Son. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ as a church. That's maturity and not worldliness. And the church is a field where people are growing to be disciples. Do you think about that as you come? I'm coming in order that God might bring growth in me. Spiritual gifts, fruits of the Spirit, that I might become more like Jesus. Second image is a building. Uh, I, I, lo I love building imagery. I'm, I'm, I'm as I say, we're doing the presbytery plan just now, and I've been hearing about buildings left, right, and center across Scotland. Um, and buildings are great. This is a fantastic building. 1876, have I got that right? Four. Ah, I've sold it short, haven't I? About two years, yeah. Yeah, Jim remembers it well. Um, <laughs> the hall built in 1964. This sanctuary refurbished in 1912, it stood for 150 years, and it's solid. And we look at it sometimes and think, may it never change. But when Paul uses the word building, that's not what he's talking about. He's obviously not talking about a physical building, but something else here. He's not talking about the static idea of a building. He's talking about the dynamic idea of building. 
you aren't God's building in the sense of a finished product. You are God's building in the sense of a building site. I laid the foundation. Someone else is building on it. Someone else will build on it after that. Someone else will build off on it after that. And so it will go on and on and on like that church in Barcelona where they were still building it 150 years later. Or medieval cathedrals that took sometimes generations to build as they were and keep changing and being shaped. That's what the building site is all about. And Paul goes on as he says that you are God's building to say this, be very careful how you are building this building. I, I, I was struck as I was reading a book about Roman architecture. Gosh, that's sad, isn't it? But I was struck as I was reading a book about build, architecture how much of Rome's buildings have survived. In fact, you go to Rome today, and an awful lot of what you see will have been built about the same time as Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians. Most of the forum reshaped by the Emperor Augustus just some years before Paul is writing. The Colosseum was built 15 years after the letter to the Corinthians was built. And one of the reasons that these Roman products lasted so long is the Romans had perfected using concrete. They mixed it with volcanic ash so that it would last. Did anyone remember that in the 1960s? As our concrete crumbles a mere 50 years later when Roman concrete has lasted 2,000. But here's the thing. If you go to Rome today and you look at these buildings, one of the things you don't recognize is that those are only some of the buildings that survived. Actually, Rome was a city of two million people at one point. It would have had building upon building upon building, and there's a whole lot of written records about the buildings that they built because the Roman tenement blocks were known as insulas, and they were not built with the greatest material. And they kept just building on top and building on top and building on top and building on top. And in fact, the posh place to live was at the bottom, not at the top, because the materials got worse as you went on. And also, if there was a fire, and there were often fires in Rome, you really didn't want to be on the top floor. Now, the point is, most of those buildings in fact, all of those domestic buildings have not survived. It's only the buildings that were built with the best materials and the best concrete that has survived all of those years. What are we building with? Will it survive the time? What will God say when the Lord returns and looks at what we have built or He has built among us? Will he care about the things that we care about? Will he be bothered with the things that have bothered us, the things that we have striven over or fought over or thought were important? Or will he ask us, where were you when I needed a neighbor? How many people did you tell about my love together as a church? Did you stand with the poor as my son stood with the poor? Did you take my commission to take the gospel to the nations? And more than anything else, did you love one another? That's what he'll ask us. He'll not ask us about buildings or the hymn styles or where the flower arrangement was or whether we had the finances in the right places or any of those things. What are we building on what Jesus has done? And is it built on the foundation of the one who gave his life for us? The last image he uses is an interesting image. He uses a temple image. Now, this would have been a bit different in the ancient world because in Corinth, as, as in most Roman cities, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of temples to every god imaginable. And if you were a Jew, though, there only was one temple, and that was in Jerusalem, the, the, the temple of God, the God who was one and, and only had one temple. But there was one thing that was in common about both of these temples, and that was that both Romans and Jews believed that in their temple, something of the divine presence lived. And that meant that one of the worst crimes imaginable was to desecrate a temple building. Because you risked, as you did that, bringing the wrath of that God down on your head and on the head of your people. 
It was a catastrophic thing to do. You did not do that to a temple. You did not damage a temple building. You did not take into a temple something that was unclean or offensive to the deity that lived there. But here Paul says this, you are God's temple because God's Holy Spirit lives in you. Something of that Holy Spirit is in you. Now, later on, Paul will use a slightly different image, and there's two different images here, where he talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in our physical bodies, and that's one of the reasons we have to respect and, and look after our bodies in, in, in every sense of it. But that's not what he's talking about here. The idea here isn't that the Holy Spirit lives in each individual Christian. The idea is that the Holy Spirit lives in the community the Christians together. It's one of these plurals which we don't translate very well because what Paul actually says is use our God's temple, plural, together. You are the temple of God and God's Holy Spirit has been put in you. You know, some people will say as they come into church, this is God's house. We should behave in a certain manner in it. Now, we could have a debate about whether God really cares about buildings and whether some buildings can be more holy than other buildings. We could have that debate. There's different ways of looking at it. I tend to think a building is more about what you do in it rather than what it is. But that, if you think about it, is what Paul is saying, not about a building, because they don't have a single building, these Corinthians. He's saying it about a community. You people are the people in whom the Holy Spirit is for the work that God is doing. God has put His Spirit into you. God has invested in you. God has filled you as a people with His love. God has sent His Son to die for you as a people. And if that is the temple of God where people will find the living God, not in a building, but among a people, then you had better respect it. You had better treasure it. And when you start drubbing around, looking for your status, checking for your own ego, worrying about your own faction or your own group or your own clique or whatever it is, trying to do your backbiting and your grieving, smongering, whatever it is, what are you doing? What are you doing to God's holy people that He has invested so much in? How dare you commit sacrilege? in the house of God, among the people of God. So, when we squabble about what we think about a building, you see what we're doing. Whether that's because we think buildings don't matter or because we think they do matter, we are actually offending the thing that does matter, that God has put His Spirit into, that God will not withdraw His Spirit from, which is the body of Christ, us, the people that He loved and He died for. And that is at the heart of this People who recognize what this community is all about is the cross. Who recognize that this is what God has done for us that stands everything on its head. Do we get that as we come to worship? For as we do and we receive it, he begins to work in us to change everything. And if we don't, then perhaps we need to get our egos out of the way. This is God's word for us, His encouragement, because He wants us to grow, to start with milk and the things that nurture us, but to grow into the deeper things and the deeper understanding of what it means to live in the foolishness of the cross that turns the world on its head. Let's pray. Father, we come, and as we have sung of your grace and of the gospel, of what Jesus Christ has done for us, who loved us and gave himself for us, 
we ask, Lord, that that might seep to our very being, that our security may be found in that. And we ask, Lord, that as we live that out together, that you might enable us to grow, to become more and more like Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that that vision of what we worship and know and rejoice in, that amazing grace might shape every part of our interactions together. Forgive us and free us from the things that we take up to knock down and to feel strong. And help us to put our strength in you. As we come today with all the needs that we have, we ask for the humility to be able to share those things and to rely and trust on each other. As we have been hurt, so we ask, Lord, that you would fill us with forgiveness for we have been so deeply forgiven. We pray your blessing upon your church. We pray your blessing on those who serve us in positions of leadership, be that in our junior church or in our Kirk session, or in any other way in this place. May we build them up as they seek to build us up. And we pray today, Lord, for our presbytery plan as it drops through the doors of, the con of congregations this week. We pray for the folk that will be disappointed or hurt by some of the things it contains. We pray for the folk who will be inspired by the next step in the journey. Bless, bless, we pray, our church in all its problems and divisions, and give it, we pray, by your Spirit, the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing as we close, all my days, I will sing this song of worship.
now may the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ be on His people, the blessing of God Almighty, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, this day and forever. Thank you.